Hello everyone. I am Tulia Chakum Pulakal Putan Vital. I hope I am not actually confusing you with my surname. <laughs> it's a very long Indian surname. Okay. So uh, let me start. Uh, my topic is vibrational spectroscopic approaches for Leishmaniasis disease diagnosis. So before I get into my topic, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land. I would also to pay uh, respect to the elders of both, both past and present. And I'm very happy to share that I have submitted my PhD thesis today. And I'm standing here to give a presentation to all of you, which is uh, an exciting opportunity. And thank you so much, RSV, for giving me such a wonderful opportunity. So let me go back to my topic. Sorry for you know going back and coming. Vibrational spectroscopic approaches for Leish Leishmaniasis disease diagnosis. So I would like to divide this topic into two. First, let me be start with the Leishmaniasis disease diagnosis. So before I would like to ask you a question: How many of you have heard about this disease, Leishmaniasis? Oh, there are many actually. So those who are, <laughs> I I didn't actually like think these many people would know about uh, Leishmaniasis <laughs> because I'm working with other kind of diseases as well, for example, malaria and other kind of tropical diseases. So today I'm going to talk about a um, part of my thesis, which is Leishmaniasis disease diagnosis. Uh, I would like to thank my supervisors uh, for, uh, you know, helping me during this PhD journey. So. These are the type of infections you can actually present in this modern world, or you can see actually in, the, in this uh, modern world. So those are viral, bacterial, fungal, and prion diseases. So as this name start, viral, so I don't think uh, I should give an introduction to the viral diseases because as we already kind of experienced the COVID pandemic, so viral diseases actually caused by viruses, different types of viruses, and bacterial disease are caused by the name itself, bacteria, and fungal, basically fungus, and prion diseases, which basically goes by prions. And in my major topic, or my major concern here is parasitic disease. So I'm going to talk about Leishmaniasis. So let's have a look at Leishmaniasis. So how this transmission of Leish Leishmaniasis species is happening around the world? So let's start with this culprit, which is a sand fly. So what it actually happens, it's bite. Who? Actually, it bites human. And what happened when it bites, it actually transmits some parasites into this particular person, that we, like humans. And what happens next? So basically, I become an infected person. If I'm basically impersonating, I become an infected person. But same time, there are many other culprits here. Like you can see rodent species, dogs, and foxes. So these are all actually acting as a carrier here, basically carrying this particular Leishmaniasis parasite to others. So if I say like the statistics here, if I show you the statistics over here, you can see these are the major prevalent areas of Leishmaniasis. And let me surprise you with the, some numbers. If I say there are over 1.3 million cases every year happening. So that's why I was asking in the starting whether have you heard about this called, uh, disease called Leishmaniasis. And with 20 to 30,000 uh, deaths. So I'm coming from India where this disease is like very common or so prevalent. And there is another question I wanted to ask. Does everyone contracts with Leishmania parasites develop this disease? No. Actually, there are, if the parasites is basically infected, uh, with, like infected, there won't be, uh, there are many cases where you won't be able to expect that all infections are, basic, sorry, all uh, contraction basically leading to the infection. Similarly, you can feel that there are some asymptomatic patients or asymptomatic uh, conditions as well, where you won't be able to see any clinical symptoms 
with the patients. So these two are very actually kind of, uh, I would say, uh, alarming, I would say. So what are the major types of this leishmaniasis? If, I, if I'm talking about leishmaniasis, there are major, majorly two, actually, actually three, but there are majorly two I'm going to discuss today. One is cutaneous. As it, the name stands, effects on the skin, basically creating sort of skin sores. And basically the incubation period will be from one a week to months of incubation within that uh, you know, carrier. And the major uh, side of it would be the swelling glands. And if you look at the visceral leishmaniasis, this is very dangerous as I would say. These are the more severe type of leishmaniasis. And it can actually have high incubation period which can probably lead from months to year and years or so. And it can affect liver, spleen, and bone marrow. So it's very deadly dangerous. So how this infection is currently being diagnosed? So I mentioned that it's been actually transmitted to the parasites from one form to other within the body and all. How this infection is being currently diagnosed? So there are several gold standard approaches in this leishmaniasis. So let me be start with uh, some of the antibodies testing. So what it happens, it will check the antibodies which is developed against those parasites. And there are some urine tests available, like from the urine sample, they are going to detect the uh, leishmanias infection. And definitely PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which are going to give you the genetic fingerprint of this particular disease and conventional microscopic approaches where you are able to see the infection with from the samples, from collecting from the patients and samples. So what are the limitations? Definitely these, uh, the uh, tests what I've already explained is having high, some of them having high specificity and sensitivity and it do has some sort of limitations. So some of them are time consuming and most of them are lab-based analysis and definitely expensive. So what should we need now? Do we need an alternative? Because as I said, these uh, diseases are more prevalent in economically backward countries. So some of these tests won't be accessible to those areas, so especially in point of care applications. So, so do we need an alternative for these sort of uh, disease? In my research, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, that's what I've done, and some of the works I'm going to continue. So I'm using vibrational spectroscopy here. So vibrational spectroscopy is nothing but when a light, or especially in my case, I'm using some infrared light, when it interacts with some of the molecules, it's going to basically behave accordingly and going to give you some sort of fingerprint as in the form of a spectra. So, uh, in uh, my research, what I'm going to do is I'm actually uh, used infrared light, basically to look at, basically infrared spectroscopy to look at the Leishmania species and Leishmania samples, which have uh, basically uh, acquired from the clinical settings, and able to look at the spectral fingerprint. So just like our uh, fingerprint, every uh, Fingerprint is unique, right? So similarly, some of these infections or some of the bands or the spectra associated with the infections also will be unique. So what I'm going to do is, and what I've done in my research is, I've actually looking at some of the important unique marker bands in each spectra, each collected spectra, and I'm actually investi investigating that using um, some of the advanced machine learning tools. So I have used different uh, type of machine learning, uh, learning tools such as artificial neural networks, or, uh, principal component analysis, some sort of uh, multivarious data analysis tools, everything to understand the uh, spectral fingerprint and to see whether this particular sample is having infection or not. So in detail, if I'm talking about, so I'm collecting the samples from the point of care uh, site just like a fingerprint of blood, and isolating and concentrating those particular 
uh, infections or pathogens pr uh, from that particular samples using a in-house de developed micro centrifuge sample, which I can only use like I can use till like 20 microliter of samples from the patients. Then I'm using this particular using spe portable spectrometers to record that particular spectra, like to collect the spectra, and using these advanced machine learning tool to see whether this infection is present or not. So in my research, what I've done, I've created a large spectral library to each and particular disease sectors, and I have basically using that particular spectral library with the new uh, clinical samples to see whether, or kind of a cross-validation to see whether this having infection or not. So, and the conclusion and future work of my uh, work, um, research is for the first time I've actually used this potent, uh, uh, vibrational spectroscopy to study the molecular structure of parasitic forms like amastigotes and promastigotes in their native aqueous functional state. That means as, as it is, laying the groundwork for future clinical studies using more portable devices. And we have developed a rapid and robust and low-cost micro centrifuge platform, as I mentioned, to concentrate this particular pathogens only for subsequent vibrational spectroscopic analysis. And for the first term, we were able to create a spectral library for Leishmaniasis infection, with, which can be used for diagnosing the infection in the clinical set settings, especially re resource-limited areas. So as I mentioned, my, when I started my PhD, I was kind of as like everyone very confused and I don't know what to do and which kind of uh, disease I wanted to look at because my supervisor gave me a lot of options. So I started with this neglected tropical diseases. So I thought this was the, should be the correct way of approaching things because these things needs to be understood or these needs to be addressed because as I mentioned, these infections are mostly present in the economically backward countries. And these are the pub some of the published papers uh, during my PhD, completely uh, related to Lishmaniasis. And thank you so much for uh, listening.